Welcome to Wanderings. This is Marty Lamb and Syl Stenman. And we're here on our fifth or sixth weeks of Wandering. And I have one little thing I wanted to say before we start this wonderful interview. You mean we're not lost, Marty? We're not lost yet. I, <laughs> I want to know, what is all the fuss about? Because last night I sat in the dining room and I looked out over everybody that was there and I saw over 50 shades of gray. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, what's all the fuss about? We have our own 50 shades of gray. <laughs> Mostly on the head. <laughs> yeah. And with that, we'd like to introduce Ben and Betsy Castillas. And the Is it Casillas or Casillas? Casillas. There's no T. Do you prefer Casillas? Either one. Okay. Casillas. Okay, and one one thing that I remember from our interview was Ben going down south to meet Betsy's family. And Ben, what did they call you? Well, one of Betsy's friends that she knew growing up, he called me a carpetbagger, and that I came and stole the bell of the South. <laughs> <laughs> She's so, still a bell. <laughs> yeah, we, we, fe we feel that way, too. But Ben and Betsy have been married since 1977, and they gave us a list of the trips they've taken, and there were 31 trips. But I think we need to hear a little bit about this um, Sunnyside Apartments. Do you have anything you can tell us about that? Betsy, you want to say something? <laughs> I moved into the uh, apartments, and from the second day, the manager kept telling me there's this man I'd like to meet, and I just wanted him off my back. <laughs> so one Sunday, I had friends over for brunch, and a man and his wife and daughter and b here comes the manager with Ben in tow and introduces us then Ben immediately uh, five minutes later dives in the pool with his glasses on <laughs> and I kind of thought God what a, a dummy <laughs> well I, the friend uh, started talking to Ben and liked him a lot and invited him uh, for brunch on on, sun, on that day. But I only had four place settings and four chairs and sets of silverware. So I said, fine, but he's got to bring his own chair, silverware, <laughs> plates, and I could furnish the napkin. <laughs> um, so that's how it started. And that was in Fresno? In Fresno. Okay. Yeah, that was in Fresno, and, and my perspective of what she was saying is somewhat identical. But this went on from April until June, uh, that he was coming to me and said, this neat lady moved in that I think you might like her, Ben, and, and you should go meet her. I think she's a neat lady. And I told Hank, I said, Hank, just stay out of my life. And he persisted on that. And I, I played golf on Saturday and Sundays. And this Sunday, June 16th, 1974, I went, played golf, came home, took a shower, put a swimsuit on and a towel and a book. And I was going out by the pool and read. And he grabbed me and took me over to see, to introduce me to Betsy. And of course, uh, I dove in the pool shortly thereafter with my glasses on and felt <laughs> a little bit embarrassed, but I just went over in my corner and 
and start reading. And then that's when her friend Don Ferris came over and, and began talking to me and, and invited me to have lunch. So anyhow, it was very nice. And that's about 38 years ago. Yes, it was, yes. It was... Uh, June 16th, I don't remember the day exactly, June 16th at 2 p.m. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or, or thereabout. <laughs> or, or, or. That's an estimate. <laughs> 204. It took me a month, him a month to ask me out. So, how he wanted to be sure he had a, a napkin and a place to sit. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long? Did you know one another before you decided to marry? We met on that day in, in um, April of 1977. We got married. And we married in Yosemite, at the little chapel in Yosemite Park. That, that's, a, that's a wonderful place. Now, we were very interested in all the traveling you did. You both really enjoyed traveling but the ones that interested us the most were the ones where you went away and you worked for two or three months like in Africa. Betsy can you tell us what you did? I'm a uh, master uh, social worker clin clinical and I uh, worked with a black uh, uh, d indigenous uh, social worker and we worked with uh, policemen wives in Africa <clears throat> in, in Zimbabwe and Harare right mm -hmm. the uh, police live in a compound and my job was to teach AIDS and uh, education to how the women can protect themselves and civil law, so the husband, uh, because tribal law says that uh, the brothers can come in and take everything, put the wife and children out in the streets, but if your marriage is registered, then they have to go through a regular divorce proceeding. So it, it's a way for women to protect their children in themselves. It was a very rewarding experience. Uh, we went into rural areas and uh, met with many, many women uh, all over the uh, country. It seems to me I remember you saying you eventually had to get tough. It seems for you, Betsy, that that was a, a big, um, I don't see you as a tough person. I th see you as a very sweet person, but I think you have that ability to do it. Oh, I could if, if uh, someone uh, gave me uh, some hassle or tried to interfere in what we were doing, then I uh, could really get angry and uh, put boundaries on people. I think that I think that just goes for being a social worker. Sort of. That you have to have to be very tough. So I have a feeling that Betsy was a velvet hammer. Velvet hammer or a, 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 a beautiful Mack truck. <laughs> <laughs> And so, what did you do while Betsy was uh, was doing her work? Well, well I, I was an electrical contractor, and when I, after I retired, we went on these missions with uh, International Executive Service Corps, which is sponsored by International Rotary and the USAID, uh, to try to enhance uh, third world countries, improve their facilities and anything they have. And I, being an electrical contractor, I was assigned to, to an, electric, an indigenous electrical contractor. And so I helped them develop new systems and drove all over the country the various projects they had. And uh, so I was the only uh, Anglo-looking person in a, in a company that had 126 employees. And you, you 
you too were the only Anglos or few, one of the few Anglos in the area in which you were, were living, right? Well, we, we, we stayed in a hotel and they had oh, another number of other people in different professions uh, there also. Uh, building mills, dam builders, road construction folks, uh, lawyers, all kinds of people. They had about um, six or eight of these folks staying in the same hotel. We were working under this program with other with other professions. So and this is a five star hotel. It, you said. it was a five star hotel called the Mona Patapa, and it was about seven seventeen stories. And we were on the eleventh floor, and. Uh, the way we looked at it, it was probably equivalent to about a third star here, but okay. in there a five star was meaningful to them. Then in your in your social life, was your social life with the uh, other Anglos or was it among the people you worked with? Uh, a little of both. We did both. And so that was interesting too. So uh, what was interesting to me is the the folks in the, these countries are poor and they don't have a whole lot but that's their life and that's and they're happy with that mm -hmm. you know they'd like to have more on this but it doesn't deter them from enjoying life and enjoying their families the the only big thing was the health situation with AIDS very quite rampant in those countries and so that was that was a real difficult issue and that's what Betsy worked on primarily and how about the mosquito factor there? Were, was that... Um there was uh, mosquitoes around the head malaria, and I learned, both Betsy and I learned, that there's five classifications or categories of malaria. Two of them are deadly, and there are three that, that uh, we... And we, they gave us prophylactic pills to take, and we had two months before we went, we were using those uh, medications and all, once a week all the time we were there and a couple months after we got home and so that protected you were us able to stay it. healthy it, on that particular trip yes a so, sub subsequent trip I did get malaria mm. so we, well you want to tell us about that trip that trip we went to Zambia the this first trip we're discussing is Zimbabwe which was used used to be um, Oh, I'm forgetting the name. Rhodesia. Uh, Rhodesia. And then this north and south Rhodesia were uh, when the British left uh, uh, and left control of that country. It broke into two countries, Zambia, which is north Rhodesia, and Zimbabwe, south Rhodesia. So in Zambia, the second trip we went, we were there for three months, and uh, I contracted malaria at that time. Now, does your malaria, I know people that have had it, and some of them have a recurrence. Have you ever had a recurrence? Uh, no, I didn't get any recurrence. It, what was interesting, they they knew how to, what malaria was, and they could diagnose it almost immediately with the symptoms that they were aware of. And they had the latest medications that were developed in uh, Belgium, and these new medications, they tried to give them to me orally, but they wouldn't. I couldn't keep them down, so they, uh, I took them intravenously, and I spent three days in the hospital. And the, the net result is that that got rid of all the, the uh, parasites in my system, so I shouldn't have any recurrences. Oh, that's that's lucky. Now, Betsy, on each one of these trips, did you do kind of the same social work kind of work, or? Uh, in Zambia, I had a little different role. I worked directly with AIDS patients uh, because in Africa, they don't feed patients. The families have to bring food in. Uh, they have to pay for every everything and uh, medications. Um, Rather than the hospital do it and billing you, they had to pay, have it on hand uh, to use if the family was. Did, did the family have to pay for the medications then? Or? Yes. Okay, and the the family brought all the all the food and fed the. They 
they did the nursing care more or less right mm -hmm. and what was the hospital space like <clears throat> were there beds uh, there enough were individual rooms uh, except the hospital Ben uh, worked in was a dormitory like you see mm -hmm. in old yeah. old movies and his only little white face in the in the that particular hospital I'll Did you have to take his food to him when he was in the hospital? Uh, no, in that particular hospital, they fed you because it was a belonged to a mining company, a copper mining company, and they ran it more like a Western hospital. Except it was old, and that's why the setup was like it was. In Zambia, what I became a mental health person and families would come in and make complaints about their family members who were acting very odd or doing a very strange behavior. So my job was to go out to the homes, evaluate the patient, and then bring them into the hospital if they appeared to need medication and uh, hospitalization. So that was very interesting, being able to go into uh, people's homes and seeing how they lived. And, uh, and were they basically receptive if you had to have someone removed or? Uh, yes, they, they were okay. Usually, uh, another aide would go with me uh, out to these hospitals and it was interesting I had to uh, find transportation on my own because uh, no one had a bus or anything uh, or a truck you know to take you to these places so I did a lot of walking but it um, it was very rewarding. I bring in and present the symptoms to the psychiatrist. Then they would take it from there. Now you did a great deal of traveling, not just on these kind of missions, but tell us where was your favorite place to go, Ben? A favorite place for me was Africa. We were there four different times, and it just appealed to us both. And uh, it just provided more of an emotional feeling and something that we enjoyed because we were right out there with the animals and staying in these uh, camps right in the middle of the uh, areas where all the wild animals were. And you'd, you'd, in a vehicle, you'd get within 10 feet of lions. And, and uh, it was just absolutely marvelous to have that. How about you, Betsy? I loved the people in both Zambia and Zimbabwe, and they're uh, sweet, loving people. There were two tribes in uh, Zimbabwe. One was warlike, and the other one was a peaceful uh, kind of people. And they're, they're so warm and genuine and um, made the best of their lives and didn't complain about their uh, place in life and thoroughly just lived day to day. And accepted us very well. They really treated us very well. And the tribe system is is still prevalent oh in very africa. prevalent in africa and, and it it takes priority they, they they practice tribal law in almost all the countries particularly in the southern hemisphere and the two tribes in uh, zimbabwe the the warlike one is a uh, late relatives of the zulu tribes in the early okay. days and uh, so they they, <laughs> they kind of took over <coughs> in a lot of places but they were all very very nice folks and uh, I teach African art at the Denver Art Museum oh you do and do some African storytelling to children 
and one thing we really try to point out now is that we do not view Africa it, through the same eyes that we did a century ago, and that's where many of our uh, art objects have come from. Exactly. But Africa is a different place now than it was even 30 years ago. So many people think Africa is a place of its own, but Africa is a, is a continent with, I don't know, 50 or 60 or 70 different countries with different cultures and different tribal factions. Uh, Zimbabwe had two tribes. Zambia had 67 tribes, oh. different tribes. And did each tribe have a different they language? Ha they had dialects okay. that they understood each other. So, But uh, it's interesting that Africa is really like the United States in the sense that each of our states has different culture aspects to it. Africa, is, all the different countries, have different cultures that are widely different. Uh, except for their color. and But they look different. They're, they have different um, well, phys the, physical features. Yeah, the people of West Africa are totally different looking than the people of East Africa. Oh, yes, very and, much. And the tall, slender ones to the short. Yes, shorter, very, very to, much. Uh, very much. Yeah. So, but we seem to, our generation can kind of view Africa the way we saw it in. National Geographic when we were in school. Very much. We went uh, to every uh, country in the south suburban part of uh, Africa and uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Botswana, Namibia, uh, South Africa. What's interesting about the differences in culture, too, is that Namibia, for example, was a um, colony of Germany. And so they, they have German uh, cultural things there, and their, their uh, clothing and their uh, various things are different than they are in other countries. And Mozambique was Portuguese, for example. The Zimbabwe and Zambia were uh, English. And uh, the Congo was, some was Belgian, as you know, there's a Belgian Congo. Yes. And so they had various, various countries had different colonies. So that, that established the different cultural mediums for different were, areas. Were you ever in North Africa? We went to Kenya and Tanzania on one trip. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's east. Yeah, east that's Africa. northeast. When, what is your favorite trip outside of Africa in yeah, I know you've been to Russia and you've been to most of Europe. Well, I'd say maybe Uzbekistan is a next favorite place, which was different because it was 95 or 96 percent Muslim, and they spoke Russian because when the Russians Russian t became the USSR, they took over all these stand countries and forced them to, to eliminate their own language and teach everybody to speak Russian. And so it's interesting because Betsy and I both had to have interpreters all the time we were socializing or working. And that, that turned out to be a different experience. And, and you worked there I wor also? I worked there with an ele as a, another electrical contractor there. And my interpreter was a young man that was spent two years in the United States in high school and he spoke good English and he spoke Russian and Uzbek. And when he interpreted it was just like a conversation I had with you folks that it, it, his his it flowed back and forth real easy and then Betsy had another interpreter that was less trained and and she went out and you can tell him what you did Betsy while you were there I worked with the women's chamber of commerce and uh, taught uh, English with a southern accent <laughs> and um, mostly and I visited many of the agencies they had uh, by a, like an orphanage and um, a welfare kind of system a uh, part of being uh, a Muslim is taking care of those people in that culture that need taken care of. And uh, one day in a park, 
I was with our interpreter, and I had an ice cream cone, and this little boy about six years old with big brown eyes came up and wanted that ice cream cone. So I, I he tugged on Betsy's leg, oh. on her tri- leg, on her uh-huh. skirt, <laughs> and look. And of course, I had to give it to him. <laughs> That's, and 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 that is the way that most Muslims live their religion. What we get now in the news is just a very small pretend, percentage. The percentage of that. that are in control. That's right. Basically, right. right That's yeah. right. Now, have you been in all 50 states? No, we have not been in all 50 states. But I think there is a special trip coming up in April, if I'm correct. Can you tell us about that? Um, I became a great-grandmother <laughs> on uh, December the 23rd, so our next trip is to Boise, Idaho, to see the new addition to our family. And um, it's so much fun to have a a baby in the family again. I'm sure that trip's going to be high on your list of favorites. Oh, um, yes. And Ben, I think you have uh, made it known that when you first came to Holly Creek, it wasn't all easy as far as, well, what do I want to do outside my door? Do I want to wander down the halls, or what do I want to <laughs> do? And something came along. Well, to, to, to preface that, when I lived uh, in California, I was not extremely social. Uh, I'd go different places, and Betsy would volunteer. After we retired, we moved to this mountain town, and Betsy volunteered for all kinds of things in the community efforts. And I, I'd hell, I'd assist, but I never volunteered to uh, uh, take on anything. And I told everybody I did not retire to work. And so I was semi-social, and but not too much. But I, we moved to Holly Creek. And we we get here, and the next thing you know, within two months, I'm totally involved, and I'm on the advisory committee, on the buildings and ground committee. I don't think I see you pass anybody <laughs> as we wander in the corridors and, now, and not now, say hello. It's just or a whole different life. I introduce myself to strangers. I used to walk away from people I knew. I'd cross the street if I saw them approaching me because I didn't know what to say to them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was my early life. But since I've been here in Holly Creek, the world has opened up, and, oh, and it's just wonderful. I, that's I great. I think that's encouraging there. for others to hear right. because we do all have this feeling everything is new. And I think Holly Creek promotes that kind of thing. And, and, do. and people who have a little bit of reclusiveness, they we, Everyone here, including the management and the residents, attempt to help them out and try to bring them out. It's all appreciated mm, from each very, other. Very much. Well, we appreciate your coming today. And Syl has, has a presentation she's going to do. Well, I met another uh, very fascinating resident here in Holly Creek yesterday, and that's Russ Yost. And if you want to um, know more about him, I'm not going to read the article, but there is an article from the newspaper on the bulletin board behind the mailboxes. I kind of stole it for a few minutes. But Russ, um, you know, he's he's a quiet person, but my goodness, what he does, this article talks about his helping um, build these derby cars with scouts, but then also come down to the Silverton Gallery and look at the showcase right outside the door, and you're going to see lots of little cars that have been sent all over the world, made by... Russ and his friends that come down. There is a workshop downstairs in the garage. Please take a look at what goes on down there. You'll be um, thrilled to know what the handiwork of these people is. So say hello to Russ and give him a pat on the back. He's doing a great job uh, along with his other crew. So this is one of the other highlights of Holly Creek. It certainly is, from my perspective. You, you, you two ladies have done, are doing a marvelous job of interviewing. I've, I've been listening to you. I wonder, they're very well trained and very adept well, and willing. I think we're learning a yeah. lot, <laughs> and mainly about the wonderful folks here, because that's a gift to us. Right. So, thank you. It's our pleasure.
the dancers in the sun. So joyous be the calls to me, come join my happy song. And the Till the 